All right, um, there, there's a couple things that I want to do today. Uh, I kind of need to back up just a step. If you have your um, Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Peter chapter 4. <coughs> now, last week I gave you guys a challenge. Uh, I challenged you to read the gift passages in their context. I'm hoping that you've done that. Uh, I'm going to touch on that just a little bit today. Um, the charismatic movement in this country has, has uh, suffered some uh, bad publicity. Um, I want to make clear to you uh, that I am an absolute believer in the use of the gifts today. Um, I am not one of those that think that it stopped when the last of the apostles died. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, some factions in the charismatic movement have been more focused on the gifts than on the giver of the gifts. Yeah. And that's led to some, some uh, pretty sketchy theology and some, some pretty sketchy positions. Um, so I, I, I want to back up a step from the gifts so that we can understand the context in which the gifts are, are being discussed. <clears throat> Now, I'm, I'm going to divide the gifts into two separate categories uh, just for understanding's sake. Um, I believe that there are two distinctly different types of gift. And even though the same word might be used uh, in, in uh, both types, um, I, I think there's a significant difference between them. Now that you've all gotten to 1 Peter, I need you to back up to uh, Ephesians 4. Keep your finger on 1 Peter, okay, because we're going to come to that shortly. Um, Ephesians chapter 4, I just, hopefully you guys have already done this, um, reading this passage in context. Um, so down in verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11, um, speaking of the Lord Jesus, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Um, I believe, and I shared this with you last week, I believe these are positional gifts within the body of Christ. I think a healthy body of Christ should have some men of each group in here. Now let me qualify that by saying, hey, chunk. Um, some people believe that uh, the apostles ceased, uh, the, the office of apostles ceased when John uh, passed away. He was the last of the original 12. Um, some people say that uh, the office of, of apostle and, and even a lot of the gifts ceased to exist after the fulfillment of all of scripture was completed. Uh, I don't believe this. Uh, I don't believe that we have apostles. Uh, if you look through scripture, there are three times, three different scenarios in which the word apostle is used. We know from looking into the word, it, it means someone that is sent a message bearer. Um, but we see that Jesus is called an apostle. And I don't believe any of the 12 who were also called out from the disciples to be apostles were apostles in the same way that Jesus was. Uh, I think the 12 had a particular purpose uh, that Jesus had just for them to accomplish. Uh, and that happened in their ministry while he was here on earth, and even more so uh, when he ascended to heaven, except for Judas, who also served his purpose. Um, <clears throat> so, the apostles... Uh, the 12 apostles had a different purpose. Uh, 
um, a, a different calling, but uh, that one of the qualifications, if you look in Acts, um, you see is they're selecting an apostle to replace Judas. Uh, they have certain qualifications, one of which was that they had to have been under the ministry of Jesus the entire time, uh, and two candidates were brought forth. Um, they had a different calling, but we see a third classification, a third group of apostles that are mentioned throughout Scripture, and, and these apostles include Paul, although I think he actually should be counted among the twelve. He was unique in his calling. I think that's what he is talking about in Galatians chapter 1 when he gives his... Um, his resume to the churches in Galatia. Uh, I think he was saying that, that uh, God had anointed him because one of the qualifications of being under the ministry of Jesus, he's, he had Jesus appear to him and call him to be an apostle. Uh, now, we have others, uh, Barnabas, Timothy, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, all of them, not James, the, the disciple slash apostle, James, the brother of Jesus, who is also called an apostle. So I believe that there's three different groups. I believe that in some manner, apostles are, are still being used today. They are being called. They're being anointed. We don't call them that. Okay? Um, oftentimes, uh, I think missionaries are actually apostles. Those that are sent to a particular place to establish churches in those places. Uh, I think that is one of the primary tasks of the apostle. Uh, and then, then there's the prophets, uh, those who speak as the voice of God to the people, um, both interpreting scripture and being the, the mouth of God to a particular place and a particular time. Um, then we have the evangelists, those that are gifted to draw into the church the unsaved, to, to use the gospel to draw into the body of Christ. Uh, we see a lot of men that are gifted with evangelism today. Probably one of the greatest that, that we are aware of was Billy Graham. Uh, but there are numerous men out there who are fulfilling the role of an evangelist. Uh, and then shepherds and teachers. Now, I, I'm approaching this as two different offices. The reason that I do that is because they are referred to in a couple of the other passages, but here um, it almost reads as though they're one gift. Uh, I, I believe that there are those who are gifted to be shepherds. They're the caretakers of the flock. They go around and check and make sure that the flock is healthy. They're looking for any signs of disease or corruption and, and shepherding the flock. Teachers sometimes uh, don't make good pastors. Okay? And pastors sometimes don't make good teachers. Okay? So I, I separate those two. Um, so, now... I believe these are positions in the body of Christ for this reason. Look down in verse 12. Each of them is called to a specific purpose, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, speaking the truth, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it handles itself, uh, so that it builds itself up in love. Now, uh, these gifts uh, being given of Christ by the anointing of the Spirit, um, 
I believe these are offices that people are called to within the body. Unfortunately, um, the way that the church today has viewed these things, um, we, we put the cart before the horse, and we have said, <coughs> instead of them training and instructing and building us up so that we might work, uh, we have just given them the work because they have the position. And this is backwards. How many churches do you know that has a particular person or a particularly small group of people that do the work of ministry? That's wrong. They are to prepare us to do the work of ministry. They are called to teach and instruct and build us up in the faith so that we then can be a functioning and effective part of the body of Christ. Okay? Because if you are in the body of Christ, don't be an appendix. <laughs> okay? Okay? Now, I've got a little bit different view of an appendix than you guys do. Okay? Um, what purpose does an appendix serve? We have no clue. We have no clue. But, when it goes foul, it causes major disruption in the rest of the body. Okay? Um, I had uh, acute appendicitis. I know Dennis has had a, a appendicitis as well. Um, it was not fun. Uh, it, it actually took the doctors uh, the better part of a week to figure out what was wrong. And the only way they could figure out what was wrong is they opened me up from my sternum to my groin and checked and looked. Um, I didn't care. Because the appendix hurt. Okay? I was at a point where I was like, you know, take it all. <laughs> Just clean it out. <clears throat> um, they, when they opened me up, my appendix had ruptured at some point prior. Um, God was gracious. Uh, the doctors were able to get everything out. Um, but I tell you what, in the body, when, uh, you know, even an appendix that serves no visible purpose, no understandable purpose, when it goes wrong, the whole body knows. Okay? And it can cause serious problems in the rest of the body. Okay? If you don't get it taken care of, it can spread illness through the rest of the body and can lead even to death. Okay? So... Uh, my, my caution to you is, first, uh, my directive to you is, you are called to serve, to minister in the body of Christ in some way. Okay? If you are in the body of Christ, you are to serve in some way. Now, I don't know how all of you guys are supposed to serve. Sometimes these things can be pretty obvious. Uh, you see somebody that... Uh, is very generous, uh, it, it is very likely that God has given them a gift of giving. Um, you know, sometimes you can just see by the behavior of the person those things that God is building them into and calling them to be. Uh, but I, you need to understand this principle. Um, I've said this before. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Okay? Um, if, if God had not equipped me to do this, I wouldn't be here. Okay? Um, being up in front still makes me nauseous. Every Sunday, I pray one more song. <laughs> one more. Um, so, back to our passage here. These are positions to which a person is called. Uh, this is something that God builds in them to be of use to the body of Christ. 
uh, and, and it is to equip the rest of us, because um, I've been in the seat that you're in, to be able to grow in our faith and our knowledge of God to maturity so that we might uh, measure to the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we would no longer be children. It's, it's a really disconcerting thing to see a, a, a person that is 50 years old, and I'm saying that because I'm in that area-ish, um, behave as a child, right? I mean, uh, I was at the grocery store the other day and, and I was in line behind uh, two people, um, that one of whom uh, very obviously had uh, some mental issues. Uh, I don't know, he, it wasn't Down syndrome, but uh, he had to be well into his 30s, possibly even 40, and uh, he was talking and behaving as if he were, you know, probably eight or nine. Um, and it, you know what's amazing about that to me? Is those are the happiest people. Oh my gosh. Just hang out with them for a while. If joy doesn't spread to you, you're broke. <laughs> okay, there's something off. Okay, um, but the same thing happens in the body of Christ. Okay, people come to faith and then park their behinds in the pew or in the chair, and that's the extent of their growth. That's the extent of what they feel they are called to in the body of Christ. Um, that's the starting place, okay? Why is it important that we have knowledge? Why is it important that we grow into maturity? He answers this further down uh, in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Uh, it's so that we're aware of what we're up against. Okay? Um, I had a friend that got caught in one of the IRS scams. Um, he got a call from a person telling him that uh, he, was, he had failed to pay his full amount on his taxes and that uh, if he didn't work out a deal with them on that phone call, that uh, they were going to call the police and have him arrested. They transferred him to another person who said he was a police officer and that he was going to come and arrest this person if he didn't make a deal with the first person. <laughs> and, and so, uh, being panicked, not knowing a whole lot about what was going on with much of anything, um, after talking to the police officer, he said, okay, what do I need to do? Well, you need to go get some money cards and give them to me so that we can just pay this off. Um, now, he got soaked for several hundred dollars um, before somebody, and, and it was actually... Uh, a person at the counter that he was buying the cards from, notice he was buying all of these cards, and she was aware of this scam, mm -hmm. and was able to tell him, hey, wait, stop. You need to call the sheriff's office and find out what's going on. And thankfully, it didn't take, cost him a whole lot more than it did, but uh, it, it did cost him several hundred dollars, and I guarantee you that that lesson stuck. Okay? So, uh, there is a, a wide range of things against us. Um, we know that we have three enemies. Uh, we know that there is the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, uh, who is opposed to us and has a demonic host that, that works at his directive to tear us down, to keep us in ignorance, uh, to distract us. We know that the world system itself is also set in opposition to us, and we know that that part of us, that stinking rotten part of us that died at salvation, still likes to interject. 
Okay? So we know there are enemies out there whose sole purpose is to ruin us. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay? We have to be uh, strong men being prepared for when the, the enemy comes, that we might not be taken off guard. Okay? So, positionally, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they are in place by God's call to build up the body so that the body can minister. Okay? Now, I believe that this, this classification uh, are, should be called ministry gifts. Okay? And I'm going to separate those um, from other gifts that I will call manifestation gifts. All right? Now, um, the reason I'm doing this is because some of the gifts that, that people are called to are long term. Okay? That they're called to be that for a long term. Now, long term is relative. Um, for some people, that might be 30, 35, 40 years. For other people, it might only be three or four or five. But the point is that that calling, that gift, is in use for the length of time that it's given you. Okay? And, and honestly, um, the way I see the New Testament church being built, uh, from the moment of instruction, you were, or, or calling, you were called until you went home. Okay? In some manner or other. Now that doesn't mean that uh, if you are called to the position of a teacher, that you got to teach Sunday school every Sunday from the time you're saved until they drive you insane and you go home. <laughs> there, there is a time to work and a time to rest. Okay? We all need to make sure we take that time of resting and refreshing. So, and by the way, do not ever use around me the term me time. Okay? <laughs> There are just certain things that just rub me wrong. Um, I understand that the new phrase now instead of me time is self-care. Um, now, there, there is a good principle there, but I think that when it's carried too far, it's actually detrimental, not beneficial. Um, I think self-care is best in the hands of God and self-care we see modeled by Jesus Christ in his ministry when he would separate himself out from the crowds and even sometimes from the disciples and even sometimes from the apostles and even sometimes from the three and, and even sometimes from the one and he just got alone by himself and he spent time with the Father okay and that was his refreshing, that was his re-energizing, that was, that was how he was being a, built up to be able to go further and do what needed to be done. So, you know, self-care, yeah. If you're living on Twinkies, you're not doing self-care. Pass those off to me and we'll make sure you don't eat them. I know, Shelly's already glaring at me. I'm not going to eat them. <laughs> All right? But I do have grandkids. You know, uh, so th there is an understanding. There is also an understanding for for mental health, for emotional health. But if all you focus on is that, how effective are you in the ministry that God has put you in? Um, you know, we, we at some point we have got to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the things going on around us. All right, so. In this passage, do you see how this was wrapped up at the bottom? What is the purpose that, that uh, Paul is talking about this to the Ephesians? I believe that he is talking about this because it is a significant factor in the proper running, the proper ordering of the church. Okay? I believe that uh, Paul is trying to tell us, and we'll see this again in, in a couple of the other passages, uh, passages that um, this we, we have this picture of what the church should look like but we don't really know how to get from here to there 
And I think that's why Paul is telling us this. Hey, these are the things that God has done that he is doing to help the church, the body of Christ, function properly, function healthily. Okay? And, and uh, you know, the, the whole title of this, this series is What's My Role and What's Your Role? Okay? Because each of us has a role to play. So, um, positional or ministry gifts. Um, now, before I get to the other couple of passages, um, you see, I'm having a dilemma here because I want to talk about the gifts, but we have to understand how the gifts operate and how they are supposed to operate. So I'm going to... Um, Flip over with me, if you would, to Romans 12. Uh, keep, keep free. Actually, let's do 1 Peter. I'll, I'll touch that, and then we'll come back to Romans. 1 Peter 4. Okay. Now, Peter is talking to the church. Um, I'm going to pick up in verse 7. Paul is speaking, uh, not Paul, Peter. If I keep saying Paul, just refer to the book you're in. Um, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now that's an interesting little thing that he puts in there because Paul, uh, uh, Peter, Peter, Paul. Peter also says that there's another thing that can hinder your prayer. Specifically, husbands. If you do not treat your wives well, it will hinder your prayers. Okay, But here he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And, and then he goes right back into where he started earlier about uh, uh, the things that are happening. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So you see right in the middle of this Christian life talk that he's giving, uh, the, the, the end is coming. Be aware. Be sharp of mind. Uh, minister to one another. He breaks it down into two categories. And if you look at the other passages, we're going to see that all of the gifts fall into one or the other of these, pas these two categories. Okay? There are those that speak and there are those that do. Okay? So <clears throat> what I find significant in this is that the whole purpose of this, the gifting, is for what? Look in verse uh, 11. It says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Uh, everybody know what an oracle is? Message. I'm sorry? A message? Yes. Yeah. A word of God. Okay. Um, I just lost my place. 11. 11. Uh, the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? In order that in everything God may be glorified. Okay? See, that's, that's our job. That's the ultimate of what we're called to, to glorify God. Every single one of the gifts given is in some way or another to bring glory to God. Now, the direct action may not speak to or of God, 
but the way in which you are used in that action brings glory to God. Okay? So, um, just touching on that real quick, because it doesn't specify the particular gifts, um, other than to separate the, the speaking gifts and the serving gifts, the, 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 the speaking and the doing. Okay? Uh, and if you remember, back a few weeks ago, we talked about the two particular callings that were given, uh, the elders and the deacons. And while the qualifications are exactly the same, the elders are called to speak and the deacons are called to do. Okay? <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that if you're a deacon, you aren't necessarily called to one of the positional gifts. I've known men that are uh, incredible doers that also have incredible insight into the work. Okay? So just because uh, you are called to be a doer or just to be a speaker doesn't mean that that disqualifies you from being used in some of the other gifts. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody understand where we're going? It's not about us. Well, it's all about us. It's all about us so that all of us can be about bringing glory to God. All right? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to stop there for today. Next week we get into Romans 12. I would encourage you again, go back to Romans 12. Read the passage in context. Okay? Why is Paul even speaking, and it is Paul this time, not Peter. Uh, why is he even addressing the issue of gifts? Okay? Nothing is in here without a purpose. Okay? There is nothing in here that's on accident. Okay? So take it, read it in context.